Hi everyone, hello and welcome to the CMAN Emerald Pace Competition webinar. Thank you all very much for making the time to join us today. Um, this should take approximately an hour. Um, and on your screens, you should be able to see a questions box on the right, um, where you can type in your questions on case writing and um, how to submit to the competition throughout the course of the next hour. Um, we'll be getting to those kind of as and when, and there'll be a separate section at the end um, to answer any questions that you've asked that we've not got to yet. If for whatever reason you don't have access to the questions section, my email will be on the end of the slides, so do um, get in touch with me if you've got any questions you've not been able to ask. Um, there are also handouts available for you to download on the right hand side. There should be uh, two handouts there. Uh, these are the EMCS author guidelines and some more information on why to submit the EMCS. So I will start off now. Um, my name is Gabby Rundle and I'm the cases publisher here at Emerald. And obviously today we are talking about the 2020 CMAX Emerald case competition, which is open for submissions now. Um, until uh, the deadline in May. So joining me today um, to give their input on the competition and advice to those wanting to submit is Olga Velagurska, the CMAN director, Michael Goldman, the editor of Emerging Markets Case Studies, and two former winners of the CMAN Emerald Case Competition, Jensen Go and Zoltan Bizardi. So the agenda for today, um, in a moment, I will pass over to Olga to give a brief update on what's going on with CMAN at the moment, and we'll talk through the deadlines of the competition. Then I will pass over to Michael Goldman, who will discuss what makes a good case study, and this will be helpful to anyone considering submitting to the competition, regardless of if you're an experienced case writer and may have even submitted to the Emerald CMAN case competition before, or if you're new to case writing. Then we'll hear from Jensen and Zoltan, two previous winners of the competition, about their experience and any tips they have for authors wanting to submit. And then finally, I will explain the other author resources that we have for anyone considering submitting um, and talk through the submission process. Um, and like I said, do type in any questions that you've got throughout. Uh, so now I will pass over to Olga um, to talk through what's going on at CMAN and to talk through the competition deadlines. Uh, thank you, Gabi. And uh, hello, everyone. It's nice to see well, at the moment 40 people uh, joining us for this webinar and the number is still growing. So thank you very much for tuning in and for your interest in the competition. So for those of you who don't know what CMAN is, uh, just a couple of words about what we do. We are uh, a management development association uh, focused on helping uh, educators, management educators in particular, and business schools and universities grow and develop. So we uh, now have more than 25 years of history uh, helping schools and educators. And we started off with some core activities, including faculty development, staff development, international conferences for deans and directors. And we also uh, saw very clearly the need for better and more relevant case material for use in our uh, management development programs. So that's how we started with the case writing competition back in 1996, so a long time ago practically from the very beginning of our um, establishment, of the association's establishment. And since 2007, we run the competition in collaboration with Emerald as our partner and in close connection with the uh, emerging cases um, collection. So uh, yes, the aim of the competition is of course to promote the creation and use of uh, relevant teaching cases but also to facilitate um, better development of case writing skills among faculty of, well, not only our member schools, but also wider regional representation of schools. So here I included some photos, and you can see in this particular four photos, Zoltan on the left side, uh, starting with winning our case writing competition in 2011 and receiving his prize at our annual conference in Tbilisi in Georgia. 
And then he did it, he did it again uh, in 2014 in Budapest, where he also met Jensen, who was uh, uh, one of the winners uh, as well, I believe, where they shared the first and second place in the competition. And Jensen and Tolton will correct me if I'm wrong. And then um, Jensen was again among the winners in 2015 in Kazakhstan. You can see the picture on the right hand side with the also two ladies in beautiful uh, fall costumes. So uh, it's a tradition uh, that our competition winners are joining uh, the annual conference to receive their prize. And I hope perhaps someone uh, from our audience today might be, you know, among the winners and join us next year in Trieste in Italy. So in terms of competition uh, timeline, if we can see the next slide, um, uh, as Gabi mentioned, the case submission deadline is 17th of May, and we deliberately moved the deadline a little bit sooner in order to enable the winners also from a little bit further away countries, especially those that need visas, to be able to join us in September for the conference. Yeah, but we also introduced one new thing this year, and that is an early case submission deadline uh, that will be uh, already in April and will enable those who submit by that time also to get some feedback from the judges. Yeah, so, and then they can revise their case and still resubmit it before 17th of May. So it's a great opportunity just to test um, and uh, work further on your case uh, using the feedback from uh, our judges and to have therefore better chances also of winning the competition. So the, we expect that the winners would be announced then in July 2020 and then will be able to join us in September to receive their award. And you can see here again some more photos of the winners from our conferences in China, in Prague, in Czech Republic, and last year in Wroclaw in Poland. Yeah, um, uh, if we can have the next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, besides Emerald being very, very generous and providing uh, the prize money for the winners and the possibility to publish the cases uh, in, the, um, in the case studies collection, from our side, we also offer program scholarships for our flagship International Management Teachers Academy, uh, a very practical uh, faculty development program. And both Jensen and Zoltan, who are here with us today, are also alumni of uh, the program, and I'm sure could share their firsthand impressions with those who are interested. Yeah, so it's a very uh, intensive, uh, very international program, focusing on very practical applications of teaching skills, methods, and materials, but having particular focus on the case method. And we will, um, if we can, see on the next slide the typical structure of the program one back yeah so it's divided into two weeks so in the first week we think, uh, we talk about more general pedagogical issues and the principles of teaching with cases also of writing your own cases and then the second week is more uh, tailored more hands-on where everyone also has a chance to teach yeah, so typically we have um, a group of 30 plus participants, very international, very diverse institutions, so also wonderful opportunity to learn from each other and to establish uh, some new contacts, uh, some new partnerships. And what we see here is a lot of collaboration going on among our alumni. And we have now more than 650 alumni uh, from 51 countries and 170 institutions. So wonderful network for potential joint research, also joint case writing, um, teaching exchange, uh, student exchange, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and we do have some scholarships also available for first time participating institutions from certain uh, regions. Yeah, uh, and the last slide, please. Yeah, so and, and this is where our next conference will take place in September. So those of you uh, who, who will win the competition will have a chance to join us for 
our annual signature event, um, the Seaman Annual Conference, where we'll talk this year about how can science and management work better together in order to help solve global challenges. Yes, yeah, so we have a number of opportunities there to meet the deans and directors of our member and partner schools, uh, also to submit contribution in the poster session if you would like to, to listen to keynotes, to participate and contribute in panels and roundtable discussions, and of course to enjoy the cosmopolitan city of Trieste, which is very close to Venice as well. So this is just very, very briefly, you know, the connection between the seaman and the case writing competition and what's in stock for you. Uh, also, you know, if you participate in the competition, you know, either you win or not, uh, we're also very happy to stay in touch and uh, to see how we can help you develop further as a teacher, as an academic, you know, as, um, as an administrator and also how to help your institution. So I would be happy to answer any questions if there will be some, but, and also please feel free to reach out to me also after the webinar if you have any particular questions. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Olga. I don't think we've got any um, specific questions on that just at the moment. So um, I think we can move on now uh, to Dr. Michael Goldman, the editor of the Emerging Markets Case Studies Collection, uh, to talk through what makes um, a good case study and teaching note. Uh, so I will pass over to Michael now. Thank you, Gabby, and, and thank you, Olga and, and Seaman, for the partnership. We are so excited uh, about the competition this year and uh, another year of, of fabulous case research and publication that comes out of this work. So yeah, Michael Goldman here. Um, I'm delighted that uh, everyone's able to join us for this conversation. What I thought I might do for a few moments um, is just kind of chat more broadly about what we're seeing across uh, emerging market case studies uh, in terms of quality of case studies and what really drives the quality consideration. So a few moments, uh, some, some slides to help us think through this. So Gabby, if we can go on to the next slide. I think the most important thing to keep in mind when we talk about case research is that uh, case research is used in a number of different ways and has a number of different outputs. Uh, and so if you think about good quality case research, there are two main types of, of output uh, that, that can be developed. Uh, on the left of the screen on the slide, uh, you'll see an article case. And the idea here is that using either a single design or a multiple design, using good quality case research, you're able to put a manuscript together that is published in a typical peer-reviewed journal. Uh, and it would be a, an article uh, that draws on case study methodology. Uh, and those certainly have made a substantial contribution to management theory and practice over decades and it's an important part of what we all do. On the right hand side is really our focus today and the focus of this competition and certainly the focus of emerging market case studies um, as an outlet for quality cases. And that's discussion-based cases, uh, also referred to as teaching cases, those kinds of, of cases that are exceptionally useful in the classroom for faculty to use them uh, to both talk about how theories are developed, but also to talk about the application of theory, especially in a learning environment with students, managers, and executives. We know that discussion-based cases can be both descriptive and more decision-focused. And so I want to spend just a few moments talking about the difference between those and the challenge for all of us as we write great case studies to think about the kind of case research we do. So, you know, often cases that are submitted not just to the competition, but also to EMCS are more descriptive in nature. So they tell a story, they have a great narrative, they, they talk about what happened. Uh, and those are useful and those are important, uh, but the challenge with those is they don't necessarily set up a dilemma. They don't set up a challenge facing a protagonist, a management character that needs to be solved. Uh, and, and so many of our instructors and professors around the world 
um, you know, might not use a case like that in a management classroom uh, because it's tough for students to really identify with a protagonist and do something about it, have a debate and come up with a recommendation that's evidence-based. So certainly descriptive cases are welcome as part of the overall collection, uh, but the better cases, those that are used more, they have a greater reach, they have a greater impact, they're used uh, more at senior student levels or at management and executive level, those are decision-based cases. Decision-based cases are very squarely focused on a management decision-making dilemma that is facing one or more protagonists in the organization. Uh, and so it's really important as we tell these really important stories around the world that we as writers, as researchers, craft the case study to have a decision point and that we tell the story up to that decision point and we make it very clear what the challenge is that the students or managers or executives, participants in the classroom need to solve. And that's where a lot of the wonderful action and energy happens in the classroom, is in the solving of that dilemma. It is, of course, also where we as instructors and professors are able to weave together and surface really important management theory so that students walk away not just coming up with great solutions, but understanding how they came up with those great solutions and how they're able to generalize that into other decision making that they may face in their organizations. So article-based cases, discussion-based cases, our focus for this conversation and the competition and EMCS is more discussion-based cases uh, and, and that's really what we're trying to do. So we can jump onto the next slide. I want to spend a few moments talking about style and talking about what makes the narrative of a quality case study different to some of the other research that we all uh, get involved in. And here the question of style is about the kind of words, and structure and language, the way we put these together to best communicate what we want in a case study. And it is quite a distinct style. I think that's really important as we find many authors, many researchers, as they put uh, discussion-based cases together, they struggle to really uh, adopt a case narrative style, a style that is a touch more journalistic in nature, more storytelling in nature, uh, less academic, if you will, in the way that we express the words and the way we put the words together. Of course, we know that this is based on rigorous research and in that sense, it is following the scientific principle uh, and it is good quality research. But the way we express those words on the page needs to fit the kind of narrative that will engage, that will draw in the students, that will allow a really rigorous and engaging conversation to happen. Uh, and so I think that's really important in terms of the distinctive style. On the next slide, you'll see two examples um, of, of some of my own work, for example, um, of how these styles differ. So if you can pop one back, Gabby. So on my, there we go, on my screen it's showing. So on the left, you've got a typical, oh, <laughs> one forward. Um, all right, I think we'll get there. So on the screen, you should see an example of two articles or two manuscripts, essentially. On the left is a typical academic article or, or kind of an article that you would see in a typical journal, uh, a lot of the, the work that we're all involved in. And so you can see just in that introduction there, um, look at the title of the article, look at the introduction, look at the kind of writing, the use of references, you know, we're writing in a fairly formal uh, way and, and that's an accepted style for how we communicate with each other within the academy. And many of us in our doctoral programs, many of us as early faculty, we learned how to write like the stuff on the left uh, because that's an important way in which we communicate with each other around our research. Case studies, although built off the same you know, research approach, uh, have a different style. And on the right-hand side, you can see an example. This is a, from a case study that we've made available on the EMCS website for anyone to take a look at a sample case study and teaching note. And you can see that it has a different style. It's a storytelling approach. 
uh, and it's really about communicating the dilemma or the interesting aspect. The title is different, the, the feel is different, and so that's really important to emphasize. In the next slide, I want to just talk through uh, some of the key points that we, we often see coming through, both in the competition submissions and more broadly. Um, I've mentioned the opening section, uh, having a clear protagonist in that first paragraph or two. You want to have a very clear protagonist that you understand who that person is, what is she facing, what's the management issue uh, under consideration, what is that dilemma, fleshing that dilemma out a little bit uh, so that the reader is clear on what, what challenge is facing the protagonist. And then placing the case in some space and time. So is the protagonist in Slovenia, in Ljubljana, looking out of the window stereotypically or doing something more interesting, uh, perhaps being on a yacht, uh, and it's located in January 2020, and the person is facing this dilemma. So you know, putting all that information early on in the case is really, really important so that uh, the context is set. Sometimes we find submissions where that information about who the protagonist is, what the dilemma is, and where in the space and time the case is happening, we find that hidden away, a page or two perhaps further in. So make sure that that's front and center early on in the case. In terms of the narrative, I've mentioned a little bit about storytelling and the thread. Uh, remember that the case is written in the past tense because we typically start the case from the end point. It's like a great movie. If you think about a great film or movie, and we've just had the Oscars in the US, if you think about a great film or movie, you know, typically that movie starts at the end. Uh, the first few minutes, think about a great James Bond film, for example, it, it starts with something happening, and then we go back and we tell the story back to that point, and it gets exciting again. Uh, so remember that most of the case studies written in the past tense, um, and all the information that's in the case should be before the decision point that you define in the case. We're going to use EndNotes, we're going to do proper sourcing, especially with secondary information, but we're going to write that in a different style, uh, more EndNotes rather than references in the text, spoken about storytelling, spoken about the dilemma. Language style, remember that it's objective third person, so she looked out the window, she faced, um, as opposed to, to obviously I or you, et cetera. Um, writing for an international audience, and I think this is really important as we write for emerging markets, is that it's, it's you know, we, we need to write in an English uh, style that is more accessible um, and that allows professors around the world, including in Western Europe and North America, to adopt these cases and to use them. So that we're telling fabulous stories of great work that's happening around the world, and it's being taught and used around the world and fully accessible. So always think about the audience and make it, um, you know, write it in a global style, write it in a way that anybody can pick up that case and without having uh, exposure to the Slovenian economy is able to pick it up and use it. On the next slide, just a few highlight points around the teaching notes, which we know is as important, if not more important than the actual case study piece. In the teaching note is where we express our scholarship. It's where as writers, we, we give both a teaching plan, so pedagogics, andragogy, we, we think about learning outcomes, we draw in great educational theory in terms of how learning happens in a room. So that's the one piece of a teaching note. It's got to be a great teaching learning focused document. But on the other side, a teaching note is also a place through our model answers and our model analysis where we can integrate recent and relevant theory uh, in a very rigorous way. Uh, and so providing that scholarship into the teaching note uh, really drives the impact and the research output of the overall product. And you can see the kinds of pieces. We have a, an author guideline, we have a a teaching note template, so there are a number of resources available uh, for authors uh, to take a look at that. Last two slides before I wrap up, um, just some thoughts on what you need to do before you submit. And I'm very excited about this competition, having the opportunity for you to submit a draft version and to get feedback because we know the iterative nature of research is really where the magic happens. So really excited about that this year. 
Before you submit, please teach your case, revise it, have someone sit in the back of the room and take some notes, have a colleague perhaps teach the case or give you some feedback. Um, we can come up with the most amazing case and teaching note by ourselves at our desk, but until you've taught it in the room and you've seen how it works and what kind of questions students ask and what kind of answers they come up with, um, it's really only existing in our imagination. Make sure we have sign off from the relevant authorities uh, and make sure that we've edited and make sure that it's accessible globally. And then lastly, uh, some final thoughts on this last slide of mine uh, around how your case may be assessed both for the competition but also generally for publication. Uh, and so one, two, three, four, five, six, I think we've got about six items on the slide. There we go. Uh, these are the important aspects and so as you can assess the quality of your work before you submit it, focusing again, characters, decision, dilemma, sources overall that are used, uh, the writing, uh, the teaching side, uh, the teaching plan, the questions and the analysis. Uh, and so those are some of the key aspects that we are focused on. So happy to take questions as we go. Um, really looking forward to the conversation and look forward to many, many submissions and many of those being published. So thank you very much, well done. Thank you very much for that, Michael. That was really helpful. Um, we've again got a few questions, but I think we will leave them to the end um, for the moment. Um, so I think uh, next I will pass over to Zoltan to talk about his experience with the competition um, and for him to give any tips uh, to authors considering submitting to this. So uh, pass over to Zoltan now. Sorry, Zoltan, sorry, I just want to make sure you're not muted yourself. I should not be, I'm unmuted now, right? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. You can hear me now, Gabby? Yep, that's great. Thanks very much. Okay, I, I did my introduction, uh, greeting everybody around the world, where, where, whether they are in the morning, in the afternoon, or maybe in the evenings. And I'm very happy and proud to share my secret of success of having won twice this uh, prestigious uh, case competition, which has actually changed my career. And I would like to speak about three different aspects. First of all, we heard a lot about the tools and techniques. And I would like to reiterate the importance of having a group protagonist. Um, also, I think the language was mentioned, but I would like to emphasize on the, on the techniques, the length of the cases. And it's really difficult to write a case study which is appealing not to the jury, but really in the use of uh, students, because nowadays they don't read that much. Uh, so the case uh, and the teaching note have to be thought of as a joint product, as we have heard. And for this, uh, the trial teaching is actually a great way of uh, testing out maybe the case is too long, maybe some elements should be moved from the case study into the background information which the teacher might share during the class session. I would like to focus a little bit more on the second part now on the theory and the uh, teaching note and the case study construct as such. It's really difficult to write a case study because as you are, one is writing a case study, it evolves constantly. Uh, the events are going forward and uh, when you reveal information, the case becomes more trivial and more descriptive. And how to get actual a case to be decision driven, I think the key is to find first uh, a theoretical framework one wants to convey why you want to teach a certain aspect uh, of a decision. And keep that in the background and then start to collect materials on one page which you would reveal as a case and uh, collect on the second page information and thoughts and materials which then will be revealed uh, through the case teacher and therefore goes into the teaching note. Um, as for teach students and for the uh, teaching part, I think the good rule I kept in my cases is basically two fundamental questions 
what is the problem, which is basically an analysis, and then give, up, give enough ammunition, enough time, enough information to discuss the second question, which is, you know, what is the, what is the solution? What action could be taken? Ultimately, business case studies should be for business communities, not for researchers, but people who want to learn faster in a classroom setting than doing mistakes in their own life. And therefore, uh, the analysis part, which we teach quite well, should also be complemented with opportunities to discuss action possibilities and uh, how to implement it. For this reason, I have uh, published and, and shared with you a book chapter, which you can now see on the screen. It's been in cooperation also with Siemen, and it's a, a very interesting book in which my chapter speaks about the emerging markets context of how to teach effectively. And, you know, these case studies which we're speaking here about are actually teaching driven. They're not so much research driven. Um, it is the other part of our academic realities that we have to teach and teaching with cases is beautiful. You can see on the, the small sentence I wrote be, behind the introduction uh, word, it is all styles of teaching are legitimate except the boring one. I mean, if you don't want to teach, that's fine. But if you're teaching, then the case should be a tool which you might want to use. If you can switch, please, to the next slide, uh, then we, you can see that one way of making this uh, case teaching uh, planning easier is to take the Rubik cube, which is a Hungarian invention, as an, an analogy. Many teachers uh, try to teach around and they want to be entertaining and relevant. It's like playing around with the Rubik cube and hope that you were lucky. Again, others uh, have devised uh, methodologies to resolve the Rubik cube. So learning about teaching techniques helps a lot to write winning case studies. And uh, the three dimensions you might want to consider when you're going to design a case is whom you're going to, this is called the, 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 the complexity cube. It is the first dimension is who are you going to be your participants, the students, uh, what is the, uh, the context of their knowledge. The second dimension is really the course subject, uh, the case uh, uh, in terms of academic input. And the third aspect is the organizational setting and uh, having two long cases, you you accept, you, you you anticipate probably that the students, the participants are very disciplined. Let me move briefly to the third aspect, the most important. I I am an expert in 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 finding internal motivation. It's called the flow. Let me tell you that having a flow, uh, your own internal drive to be a case winner is actually a great additional resource to all the techniques and all the knowledge. I have received this flow to write good case studies through the Seaman Emerald Corporation and the events which Olga has mentioned in the introduction. So most people uh, will get inspired how great teaching can work with great case studies on such professional faculty development events. So one goes hand in hand, the writing of the case study and the ability to teach it but if you participate on such a course, uh, such an event, you will get samples of how the cases could be used. And you also see also, of course, good case studies by the, the case teachers. The second part of flow at, uh, for writing good cases is once you start the work, it's, you, you might get distracted. You, you think that the process is too difficult. But keep in mind that once you win a case study, you get involved in this interesting network, which I just mentioned, Emerald Publishing and Seaman. And on those events, you can feel like a king of, for the day. Being a case winner is such a great uh, advantage in many of our professional uh, careers that I think it is uh, more redeeming than having a, a, a third or fourth paper published, which probably people uh, put on the CV and that's it. Because once you have a case study, your own case study, and you submitted it and you get also the stamp that it was a good one, you will love teaching with it. I use my case studies after many years again and again because they had a decision dilemma and it has been well crafted. But each time I'm using my own case studies or cases which, which have won, it makes the day of being a teacher and an educator beautiful. It gives me then the flow of transferring uh, the knowledge. So these are the thoughts which I would have liked to share with you. 
to summarize tools, techniques, the balance between theory, teaching note, and the case itself. And third aspect is to find your flow, which is not a, uh, is a, is a psychological process and it can be kicked off uh, in, in communities, in learning and case writing communities such as this one. And ultimately you share your knowledge, the, 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 the case in your own uh, meaningful activity, which is being an educator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Zoltan. That was really helpful. Um, so I think uh, now I will pass over to uh, Jensen, another uh, past CMAT ML case competition winner, um, for his insights into the competition and any tips for, um, for authors wanting to submit. Yeah. Hi everyone, Jensen here. I'm quite sure you realize that I'm no longer in the academic. Uh, so those two cases that I've written out was uh, done in those days when I was still in the business school uh, in a private university of Singapore. Uh, actually, I have a slightly different uh, experience from Jotan. So it's interesting that we could uh, compare notes and you can see there are actually different pathway uh, when you're interested in writing case. For me, when I decided to write case, it's purely for developmental purposes because I've, uh, I've been a case study researcher uh, and I always wonder how could I write good cases to teach and I thought the best way to challenge myself is to write a case and, and submit it to a competition and see whether uh, the way in which I wrote could be recognized by other people. So I, I, done it, I do it purely for developmental purposes. Uh, and, and the approach that I undertake was uh, also slightly different from, from uh, what Jotan has shared. I'm sure he might have written cases that's doing a different approach. So I share with you a different perspective or different way in which you can approach this. For me, the starting point is always looking for interesting phenomenon. Uh, so you can always find a lot of interesting phenomenon that is on the newspaper or in uh, companies that or people that you interact with. So for example, right now, uh, with the coronavirus uh, spreading, you, it's quite interesting that you could find a case that, uh, or maybe a certain phenomenon that's relating to how healthcare uh, managers actually manages, uh, particularly in Singapore, the coronavirus. Uh, and that would be something of significant interest to anyone uh, who is uh, thinking about understanding the challenges and the dilemma that they face. So uh, phenomenon to me is the starting point. I look for interesting phenomenon and of course, those phenomenon will present a dilemma that, that we could write a case on. But you might wonder, you know, if you have a good phenomenon uh, and you can collect, and if you have access to it and you can collect data, then what about theory? So what I usually do is after I collected the data, preliminary data from secondary sources, I will try to find access to that organization uh, to be able to actually have an interview with that person. So through that interview plus the secondary data, that's where I form an idea of how I could frame the phenomenon and I look for theories that could be able to uh, meet those, uh, I mean, get aligned with the data that I've collected. So I have this, uh, this book that I really always uh, reference to, it could be a good resource for you when you're thinking about how to connect your data with theories. It's called A Little, a little Book on Big, management theories so within it there are a lot of uh, more than 30 or 30, 20 to 30 management theories and they actually teach you how to use it so that book uh, is a good summary of all the various different theories and you can actually try to do a alignment uh, when you collect the data you look for those theories and see how you could craft it out uh, into a compelling stories and where people are interested to read and interested to get to know more about the dilemma and face all the situation that the protagonists are facing. So that's one aspect of crafting the case story. But on the other, on the other side of the teaching notes, uh, what is really fundamentally important that you need to reflect on is your teaching philosophy. That means where do you think learning really happens um, for your students? How, what, what is your philosophy of teaching? And this, this anchor a very important aspect of how you would write your uh, teaching notes and how would you think about uh, your teaching approaches? Uh, because for, I'll give you an example. For me, I personally believe that as a teacher, uh, I'm, I need to create a right environment for learning to happen. 
uh, I'm much like a gardener, right? I don't think about uh, certain specific, very clear learning outcome that the students must intentionally be able to meet. But I try to think about the outcome from a standpoint of creating the environment for the outcome to happen. So that's my teaching philosophy. And that's why when I'm writing the teaching notes, I think about how to create that outcome and what are the activities that I need to do in order to create the outcome. And of course, I tested it out to make sure that uh, the, it, it, the intended outcome is actually being created. Uh, the other thing that you need to think about, right, is about student learning. Uh, how do you assess learning? How do you induce learning? So this is the part where I think the first time round when I was writing it, I actually reached out to Zotan and he actually gave me a lot of tips about this. I think one of the things that I learned from him uh, is how do, uh, the kind of skills that you as want the, uh, uh, the, the, the student to acquire at the end of your, of your uh, case actually play a big part on how you write your case as well. So for example, if let's say you want the students to develop their ability to sift through massive amount of data, then you will obviously write cases right, with a lot of information, a lot of some, some are redundant and some not relevant at all, and some are really relevant, and you want to train them to be able to sift out those data. So these are some of the skills uh, that you need to consider when you're writing your case as well as your teaching notes. Yeah, and then the final part that I want to share about is how to write good case is how to get access to all these data and write good cases is really through network. So my personal experience is uh, I, I I do a lot of network, so I was able to get hold to my uh, the first organization that I was able to win the case. And in the winning, um, when I went to Hungary to receive the award, I was seated beside a teaching uh, award winner, and his name is Adrian. Uh, Adrian is in South Africa and is a professor there. And then then we struck it off, and then. Uh, a few months later, I wrote to him and said, do you have an interesting uh, South African case that we can work on? And that's how it all started out. And we submitted the case and we, we won another time. So I think the importance is also an uh, element of finding, looking for good uh, phenomenon that you can write about, interesting one, and then having the network to gain access to actually go into the organization to actually talk to the people on the ground then finding a, a, a theory books that you can rely on to actually think about the theories and of course on the teaching side you have to think about your teaching philosophy and uh, what you want the students to learn so that's all i'd like to share yeah thanks brilliant that's great thank you very much for that Jensen. um so now i'm going to be talking uh you through how to submit a case for competition um, the author resources that we have available and the rights requirements. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is a section on the right of the screen with some handouts, um, and these are the EMCS author guidelines and the, uh, some reasons on why to submit to the Emerging Markets Case Studies Collection. Um, all of these slides will be sent around at the end of the webinar, so you will be sent these links. Um, so on the screen, you can see the link to the Scholar One submission site. So when you're ready to submit the case, you just click on this link. If you don't have an account already, you just create one. And one of the first questions on submission is, are you submitting to a case competition? And uh, the CMAN 2020 is obviously the, the option that you would select. All cases need to follow the standard EMCS author guidelines, uh, which are attached to the webinar. If you can't down the, download these for any reason, um, or you don't get the, the links don't work, uh, I can email you these afterwards. All the cases should have a developing and emerging market focus, and all cases need to be teaching cases based on a real situation in a company with a clear decision-making solution, and obviously all need to have a accompanying teaching note. It's important that all necessary permissions have been cleared before you submit. This includes case study consent from the company that the case is focused on, if any primary research has been carried out, as well as permission for any images or photos or any, any references to images that are in the case that you've not created yourself. Again, if you're not sure that that applies to you, do send me an email afterwards and I can let you know. Um, next slide. Um, 
uh, some more uh, resources. Um, so I will very quickly now uh, show you the uh, Emerald Cases Hub that's in there. So I just wanted to bring your attention to this new uh, cases resource that we have. Some of you might already be familiar with this. Uh, this is the Emerald Cases Hub. Um, we've got four modules on here on how to write case studies. Um, we've also got new modules on here on teaching a case study, uh, which were new and uh, went online at the end of last year. Um, so if you've had a look on the on the hub before, but not recently, these might be new to you. Um, but for the moment, let me quickly show you the writing a case study modules. So we have modules on here on identifying a need, getting ready to write, writing the case study, and evaluating the case study. Um, so for example, if we go getting ready to write, there are kind of subtopics within these. For example, selecting a topic. And there are various resources on that. Uh, Dr. Michael Goldman um, helped us put this together. So there's a lot of information specifically from him on this. Um, and again, it would be specifically beneficial to anyone wanting to submit to the Emerging Markets Case Studies collection. Um, now I just quickly go back to the other author resources that we've got. So as you can see on here, uh, we've also got a guide to writing teaching cases, a guide to writing a teaching note. We've got a standard teaching note template for you to use, a case study title page, the consent to publish release form, which as I mentioned is important. Um, all cases submitted to the competition will be considered for publication in the Emerging Markets Case Studies collection. So they'll go through the standard peer review process. So it's very important they haven't been submitted elsewhere and that all necessary permissions um, have been granted prior to submission. Do you get in touch with me if I'm not sure about any of that? Oh, sorry, and then just a note on the Emerging Market State uh, Case Studies collection a bit more generally. Uh, as I said, all cases submitted to the competition will go into the peer review process and will be considered for publication in EMCS. Beyond the competition, we do welcome submissions at any point to the collection, which covers all areas of business management disciplines in any emerging market. We also pay uh, authors £100 on publication of their case study. So regardless of the outcome of the competition, so if you submit but you're not successful with the competition, it will still go through review, it could still be published in EMCS, and then the authors would still be eligible for that £100 payment. And obviously, if you do win, then you're still eligible for that payment as well as a bonus. Um, and then finally, I'm always happy to discuss reviewing opportunities and we're open to your issues. So if anyone wants to get in touch with me um, to discuss these kind of further opportunities um, to contribute to EMCS, please do get in touch. Um, and now I will have a quick look. Um, I know we've got a few questions that people have been waiting um, for us to get to. So the first one here is, what is the minimum criteria for a case writer qualification? Um, I think, Michael, you might be the best person to answer this, if I'm right to pop that one over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Gabby. So in terms of qualification, I guess typically we're seeing cases written by those who are doctorally qualified. Uh, but Gabby, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we have any specific academic qualification that's a requirement. My sense would be that um, those 
people perhaps without doctorates who are doing really good case research, um, perhaps from master's level qualification, master's level studies, I think would certainly be able to put together great cases. And I know, for example, that a number of professors are working with their MBA students and other master's students to develop great cases. So from a qualification point of view, I, I don't think there's anything set in stone. Uh, the key thing is about doing good quality case research, uh, as, as has been discussed today, uh, and putting that together into something that is extremely engaging as an output. Thanks for that, Michael. No, I, I second that. We don't have any kind of specific um, minimum criteria. So just to, to reiterate what Michael has said on that one, thank you for that question. Um, next, we've got a question, what happens to my case study if I don't win? Um, so that I kind of briefly touched upon, so it will go through the standard EMCS review process um, and will be considered for publication um, uh, within the EMCS uh, collection. So it will be kind of a standard process um, if it's not successful for the competition. Um, and then another question here. Can I write my case study just based on secondary data? Um, again, I think I will answer this briefly and then pass back over to Michael if that's all right to give a bit more information on this. Um, you can uh, base a case study just on secondary data. We don't have a rule against that. Um, but generally speaking, um, the kind of more comprehensive case studies would be those that the author has spent time within the organization um, with the protagonist to kind of make it a bit more comprehensive um, and am I right to pass over to, to you Michael to kind of add a bit to that? Yeah absolutely I think Jensen captured it really well in his comments you know you can you can gather data from secondary sources to start and that's a really good starting place as you see a phenomenon happening in the environment around you a recent current interesting phenomenon so i think that's a great starting point and as jensen says the key idea is to then reach out to protagonists reach out to contacts within that company uh, and you need to get more of the backstory. You need to understand through primary interviews, primary data interviews with people. You need to understand what was happening in the decision making, what's, what was happening behind the scenes in those management meetings. That's really important from an engagement point of view for the case study because just writing a second resource case means you're putting together probably a whole bunch of newspaper articles and maybe some reports. So you're collating that into one place, but you're not really adding any research and you're certainly not adding the voice of the protagonist, uh, someone that the students can, can wear their shoes, can take their role. This is also really important because some people write uh, a case only with secondary source data, but they infer actions and beliefs to the protagonist, right? So Jane is in Slovenia and she was feeling sad or she was feeling apprehensive about this upcoming board meeting. Well, how do we know that Jane was feeling apprehensive if we don't actually talk to her? Uh, and for us to infer or to, um, you know, create this, this, this storyline just from secondary sources runs the risk of not actually being true. Uh, and so that's why it's really important that we interview Jane, for example, in Slovenia, have her sign off on the way we've, been, we've expressed her actions and beliefs in the case because it is therefore actually true. Uh, so yes, you can write cases from secondary sources, they're typically more descriptive, they don't really have the depth around the dilemma. Um, it's unlikely that those cases are, are, are to be you know, extensively used, they might have a more limited reach, um, and it's unlikely in our experience that those are going to be award-winning cases. Thank you very much for that, Michael. That was really helpful. Um, we've got another question here. Uh, after case submission, do I give the copyright to Emerald? Um, so at case submission, um, part one of these submissions questions is you confirm you've not submitted it anywhere else. So at the submission stage, that is all we ask for. Once the case has been accepted, we then ask, um, we send authors a copyright transfer agreement. So obviously it's only upon acceptance that um, we, we ask for the copyright. Um, and if uh, the person who's asked this, I can send some further information about 
uh, the kind of personal use. So we would own the copyright, but you can use the, the, the case study on kind of a personal repository, and there are certain limitations there. But yes, um, on acceptance of the case, uh, we would expect the copyright to be assigned to Emerald. Brilliant. I think that's that's everything um, for the moment. Um, if you have any questions uh, that uh, you think of after this, my email is on the screen there. Um, so please do get in touch afterwards. Oh, sorry. I'm getting a, a few more questions here now, and I will respond to you all individually. I think it's very quickly time for more, sorry. What happens with the permission letter if the company was liquidated? Um, so I'll answer this one just briefly. If the company um, has entirely ceased to, uh, to be running, um, then case study consent can't be granted. Again, we would want the kind of details of it, um, of what happened to the company, but then that is something that we'd be able to look at and be, potentially be able to publish without um, case study permission. Uh, but what we do find sometimes is a case a company might be taken over by another company, in which case we would still require permission from the company that now owns the original company, if that makes sense. Um, sorry, so I will uh, we're kind of running out of time there now. Uh, so like I said, if you do have any questions after this, do send me an email and I will get back to you. Um, the slides and recording will be sent around to everyone who has attended. And if you do know um, anyone that this might have been of interest to, please do share these, the slides and the recording around to them um, and do share my contact details with anyone who might be interested either in the competition or in um, collaborating with EMCS more generally. Uh, so I would just like to finish by thanking everyone who joined us today and especially thank you to our panellists, um, to Michael, Jensen, Zoltan and Olga. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise and thank you to everyone who attended. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this and it's been useful to you, um, whether you're a new case writer um, or a more experienced case writer. I hope this has been helpful um, and just good luck with your submission to the case competition. Thank you very much, everyone, and I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.